Hello guys and gals, and this is part 16 of our reading of A Natural History of Dragons, a memoir by Lady Trent. It is a book by Marie Brennan. As always, we're going to go over the copyright information, which clearly says here, let's find it in here, clearly says that copyright, uh, copyright 2013 by Bryn Noonschwander. All rights reserved. Interior illustrations by Todd Lockwood. Maps by Riss Davies. And designed by Greg Collins. Anyways, um, in the last chapter, um, Lady Trent, well, Isabella Camhurst, otherwise known as Lady Trent, went to these ruins that and then all the townspeople were really upset that she went to these ruins because the ruins were like supposedly possessed or had ghosts or something. And the fact that she twisted her ankle there didn't really help her case any. But anyways, um, we're going to pick up where we left off then. Um, Okay. Oh, also, um, a boy brought her a um, a preserved dragon part, a part of a dragon. Um, okay. Tata said the. The Lord's man wanted skin, so he sent me back with that. The Lord's man? Mr. Wilker, I guessed. I hadn't been aware that he had asked locals for help. Not a bad idea, I murmured. Um, under my breath, fetching a pair of tweezers and lifting the, the, the scrap of hide from its aromatic container, many of the shepherds carried jars of of Zuka with them. It was my pet theory for how they survived without anything one could call a proper summer. Light, light more candles, if you wouldn't mind. The boy obeyed and hovered to watch eagerly over my shoulder as I gently parted the hide into a semblance of dryness and laid it on the microscope. My familiarity with the device was minimal, but I dared not wait until the men returned. Biting my lower lip, I bent and looked through the eyepiece. Microscopes are fiddly things. It took endless minute adjustments of the knobs before I had a clear image. I held out my hand and called for a needle several times before the boy said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Then I realized I had been commanding him in skirling. I surfaced long enough to point to my pincushion. I had been mending my much abused ruins dress, ruined dress, rather, when he arrived, and he brought it to me. Instrument, instrument in hand, I returned to the microscope and began to prod the magnet, the magnified hide. What I discovered will be no surprise to those familiar with dragon anatomy. It had since been found in many different species. At the time, however, it was quite a revelation. The roughness on the underside of the wing comes from tiny scales, which are not proper, oh no, not present on the upper surface. These cover tiny holes that perforate the wing and are hinged to form a sort of valve. When the wing lifts, the valves open, reducing the resistance. The dragon, uh, the resistance, the dragon the dragon's muscles must overcome. When it sweeps down again, the valves close, allowing the stroke to have its fullest effect. I did not immediately understand the function of what I saw, but began drawing it nonetheless when the epiphany came. I exclaimed out loud, quite startling the boy who had wandered off in boredom, as I drew and now aimed Jacob's rifle about the room. Careful with that, I said absently, scribbling notes on my drawing. I had long been accustomed, accused of having no motherly instinct. As nearly as I can tell, this instinct consists of attempting to wrap anyone below the age of 18 in swaddling bands. So 
that they never learn anything about the world and its dangers. I fail to see the use of this, especially from the point of view of species survival, but I do confess that on this occasion I may have let my intellectual excitement distract me from the peril of allowing a 10-year-old young, a 10-year-old boy to, to wave a loaded rifle around. Fortunately for all involved, the boy's boredom soon overwhelmed him. I flapped my hand in the general direction when asked if, if I needed, oh, I flapped my hand in his general direction when he asked if I needed the jar of, of, of Arzuka any longer. He collected it and departed, and I fetched out Gotherham's avian anatomy to assist me in my speculation to the mechanism of dragon wing flight. When the sun began to set, I did not even notice except to hunch closer to my sketches as the light fa failed, and thus did the menfolk find me. I knew as soon as I surfaced the, that now was not the time to share my discovery. Jacob and Lord Hilford entered together deep in worried conversation. Haven't been in any rains, the Earl was saying, nor enough snow even up here to justify it, much less in the lowlands. It, it's been nearly a month. He should have returned long since. Who should have? I asked, diverting, diverted from my work and rubbing the fatigue from rubbing my fatigued eyes. Gretelkin, Jacob said, dropping with a fr um, dropping with a frown into the nearest seat. Our host, supposedly the Rez the Rezesh, who should have been our local guide in this work. To my shame, I had nearly forgotten him. Return from Chiavora, you mean, I said. Jacob's face was grim. If he ever went. At this, I laid down my pen and sat straighter, hardly noticing the cramps in my shoulders from hunching so long. You think someone lied to us? I don't, Lord Hilford said, pacing along the, the creaking floor. Your husband is more more is a more suspicious sort. No, too many people agree that Gretelkin went to intercept us. I fear that something happened to him along the way. In the gloom of our work of our workroom, the suggestion was more than ominous. It was frightening. But I was determined not to believe not but I was determined not to be behave like a nit. I made certain my voice was steady before I asked. The dragons? Lord Hilford shrugged. Any any number of things can befall a lone man on the road. Illness, bandits, he might have been thrown from his horse. But you think it's the dragons, I said. A scientist must never reason ahead of, of his data, Mrs. Camhurst. We had data. We knew the local rockworms were acting human were attacking human beings, and furthermore, that although the bulk of the incidents had taken place higher up, at least two had occurred in the direction of Chiavora. But this I was willing to concede, hardly, con uh, hardly con 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 constituted proof that Mr. Gretelkin had been eaten by a dragon. The question was, what would... Uh, oh. Wait. I was... Um, checking. Ah, oh, 77% good. Okay. Um, we had data. We knew the local rockworms were attacking human beings, and furthermore, that although the bulk of the incidents had taken place higher up, at least two had occurred in the direction of Chiavora. But this, I was willing to concede, hardly con constituted proof that Mr. Grotelkin had been eaten by a dragon. The question was, what would? Should we send someone towards Chiavora, I asked? They could inquire along the way, see if anyone recalls them passing through. Though the land was peopled sparsely enough that our odds were not very good. Perhaps, the Earl said, but who? I'm loath to abandon our research. The answer seemed obvious to me. I could go. Absolutely not, Jacob said, coming, to, coming bolt upright in his chair. 
His vehemence was startling. Were you not encouraging me to return to Chiavora not long past? When you, when you could go with the Chiavorans, Jacob said. When, oh, who would escort? Who would escort you now? I'm not concerned about propriety. He added, waving away my objection before I could speak. Rather, your safety. All the things that can befall a lone man on the road could easily befall a lone woman. Perhaps it was due to the darkness of the room that I focused so much on his voice rather than his expression. The latter, I expected, was fairly well controlled, but I heard real tension in the former, even fear. A thousand counter-arguments rose to my tongue. I was a fully competent housewoman, uh, horsewoman, sorry. Dagmira could accompany, could, uh, could accompany me, better me than, than, say, Mr. Wilker, who was a far more used to the expedition. I voiced none of them, because one thing was stronger than my argumentative streak, and that was my desire not to cause my husband distress. I had failed significantly. Um, I had failed signally at that goal since coming to Vistrani, Vistrana, rather, but I did not want to fail again right now. I rose from my chair and went over to him. Worthlessly, I held out my hand and worthlessly he took it. We gripped each other's fingers tightly in the dark, and that touch communicated everything that we needed. We were in a foreign place surrounded by... more danger than either of us wanted to admit, and we had very little beyond each other and our companions. But that might be enough. Mr. Wilker arrived then, breaking the spell, and while Lord Hilford explained the situation, I went around the room and lit candles, which I should have done long since. In their warm light, our circumstances seemed far less bleak than they had a moment before. Could we ask some of the village men to go, I, I said. I thought of that, Lord Hilford said, and we may try, but it's a bad time to be asking. The shepherds will be taking their flocks up in the high pastures soon. They won't have anyone to spare. Let me just make sure this was... Yeah, okay. For one brief irrational moment, I entertained the notion of finding the smugglers and asking them to inquire, but but, but Chatskel um, would not want to see me, not after my reckless promise to him in the mountains, that we could make the dragon stop attacking. A promise I was not, I was no closer to upholding now than I had been that night. Then a better thought came to me. Could we ask the boyer for help? I knew by the sudden quiet that I had hit upon a very real possibility. When I turned from lighting the, the last candle, I found the men exchanging looks. You haven't met the man, have you? Mr. Wilker asked. Lord Hilford shook his head. Gretelkin was to introduce us. They're a standoffish lot, the boyers of Vistrana. But, oh, not, not a one of them in Vistrana. No, not one of them is Vastrani himself, and they all look down on the peasantry. Half of them spend all the all their time at the Tsar at the Tsar's court in Kupelia. Kupeli. And leave the actual running of the of their domains to their agents. The 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 Rizashi and so on. But Gretelkin said this one was this one had has taken to spending more time here. One one of favor in Cupelli, maybe, or he just likes the mountain air. Yosef Abram Abramovic Kizov is his name. Although I had hardly ingratiated myself with the locals, I had overheard a few comments, which I hastened to share. He isn't much li like a Drusen Drusenev, I'm afraid. He thinks himself too good for this place, even though he isn't rich. Well, he's rich compared to the villagers, 
but it doesn't sound like much to me. He had a good friend from Chiavora, though, some kind of doctor or scholar who's staying with him right now. We may hope for the evidence that he's friendly to foreigners. And who does this information come from, Mr. Wilker asked. The women of the village. He muttered something dismissive beneath his breath from which I can could can only catch the words gossip, but Lord Hilford nodded. I, I could believe it. Gretelkin said the man was ambitious and not very loyal to the Tsar. Whether that makes them amenable to help uh, to helping us, I couldn't say. It's at least worth a try, Jacob said. You'll have to be the one to go, though. A skirling earl should impress a boyer at least enough to get Lord Hereford through the door. Um, after that, we would have to see how helpful Yosef Abramovic Kizov was willing to be. Chapter 14 A noise outside the sauna Further disturbances in the night Footprints and Zagret Matt Okay, let's get this underway then Let me just check the time here Okay Making good time Lord Hilford set off that very next morning With a local man for escort It was two or three days journey To the Boyer's hunting lodge no sooner had he departed, though, than, than a new trouble reared its head. It began while I was in the sauna. For those unfamiliar with the, pra with the practice, saunas are what the Vistrani use in place of bathing. Rather than subjecting themselves to the ice-cold waters of their homeland or heating water for individual use, a wasteful practice when one con considers it, they build structures in which they burn wood to heat stones. After the smoke has been released, one may sit inside and enjoy the warmth. This induces sweating, and when the moisture is scraped away, it carries the dirt with it. But, uh, but as the mention of sweating may indicate, one uses the sauna completely naked. Because of this, the Vistrani strictly regulate who may use the building when. Women stoke the fires in the morning, then clean themselves while the men are out in the evening, and the men have their turn. Each sex uses the building communally, though, and here my squirreling sensibilities put their foot down. I could not bring myself to sit naked with the village women while they exchanged gossip too rapidly for me to follow, or more likely sat in awkward silence. I imagine they preferred not to have me among them either. The sauna is expected to be a time of of convivial relaxation, and the presence of a stranger rather inhibits that. We had therefore arrived at a compromise, which was that I put up with the blistering heat and smoke-tinged atmosphere immediately after the sun is airing is exchange uh, after the sun is airing in exchange for privacy i should have overcome my hesitation it would have been better to socialize more with the people of drusenev and participate in such rituals of daily life is very effective in the in that regard as it was though i preferred our arrangement after the initial sm smothering effect of the warmth such a contrast to the crisp mountain air I, seld I, I settled in comfortably, sweating out my tension along with my dirt. Lord Hilford had ridden away that morning to visit the boyer. Yosef Ab Abramovic Kizov would send, would send out men. Um, Jendrik Gretelkin would be found, and all would be well. A coughing, moaning, snarling noise brought me bolt upright on my wooden bench. Initially, it was simply start startlement. When, oh, what, what had that been? I wondered. It sounded as if it came from outside. I listened but heard nothing more and moved to lean against the wall once more. An instant before my back touched the warm planks, the noise came again. 
This time it sounded closer. Every hair on my body tried to stand up. A difficult task in the stifling heat. The noise, whatever it was, came from no human throat. Nor was it a sheep or a wolf or anything I was familiar with. The, the most likely of candidates, my mind informed me in a rational fashion, entirely at odds with the chill running down my spine, was a bear and dragon. Fear gains particular force when one is naked. It, it doesn't matter whether clothing would be of any use in the situation. Linen and wool would do nothing to protect me against the claws of whatever creature lurked outside. What matters is the psychological effect I felt. The psychological effect. I felt vulnerable, with only the wooden boards of the sauna protecting me, and yet I wish the boards were not there because that meant I could not see the source of the noise, could not see and could not easily run from. Silence. I, I held my breath, then forced myself to release it when the heat swift, swiftly made me lightheaded. The ex, exultation turned into a pitiful yelp, as something scraped along the logs of the outer wall. Where, where were the villagers? The sauna stood a little distance apart from the houses, a little distance apart from the houses of Drustenev, but not all that far, and surely a bear or a dragon or whatever was stalking me was too large to be overlooked. I thought about crying for help, but fear of provoking an attack paralyzed my throat. A rasping, grating sound moving as silently as I could. Oh, a, a rasping grating sound. Period. Moving as silently as I could, I pressed myself to the far wall and cast my gaze about for anything that might be used as a weapon. The hot stones could surely burn the creature, but I had nothing with which to lift them except my own tender hands. The benches? Could I swing one at the creature's head? Only if I first maneuvered it out the door, or the beast tore out one of the walls. Nevertheless, it seemed my best op option, so I wrapped my hands around the plank that formed the seat. It was heavier than I expected, and I grunted a little as I lifted it. Then I stood waiting until my arms began to tremble, and I had to put my makeshift weapon back down, but I remained crouched over it, ready to snatch it up once more. Nothing. And still nothing. Then a knock at the sauna door. I screamed. Every nerve in my body was drawn so tight the, the slightest noise would have snapped them like harp strings. And then, and this was a brisk, impatient rapping. Others are waiting, Dagmira called through the door. Then, as my scream registered, Are you all right? Yes, I'm, I'm fine, I called back, panting with, with fright. What a lie that was. I was stumbling over my own feet as I passed through the inner door into the dark little anteroom that kept too much heat from escaping when people went in and out. I always disrobed there, not quite trusting the villagers, the village etiquette, to make everyone look the other way as their fellows stripped down outside and not willing my willing to subject my flesh to the mountain chill either. Hastily, I shoved myself back into clothes, to clothing and shoes, sn snatching up my bonnet and then tore the outer door open to find Dagmira waiting. She peered at me closely. What happened? I ignored her, plunging left mo leftward to make a circuit of the sauna hut. And, and here, something impossible greeted my eyes. Nothing. No tracks, save for those left by human feet as people went about the building, taking firewood from the nearby pile, leaving their clothes and baskets by the door. I was too much of a huntswoman to read the ground and know what had passed there, but surely anything as large as, as that su sound suggested must have left an, Im an impression. <sighs> Dagmira was waiting when I completed my circuit, with her hands on her hips. What are you looking for? Already doubt was beginning to creep into my mind. Had I imagined it? Nodded off? 
on my bench, perhaps, and been awoken by a bad dream. The the heat made me lightheaded. I knew that. I could it could, I could have been de delirious. It didn't seem likely, but no less so than the, than that sound and the lack of evidence for its source. But I didn't have the presence of mind to form a conclusion, uh, a convincing lie, for Dagmira either. Not that it would have done in anything to change what what followed later. Nothing I said. Then added, "I'm sorry I took so long. If anyone is looking for me, I'll be in the workroom." Cramming my bonnet back atop my head, I floundered up the slope towards Gretelkin's empty house. I slept badly that night. When I awoke, though, I thought it only the usual pause between first sleep and second, and lay for a moment considering what I wanted to do with myself during that wakeful time. We're going to have to stop that here. We've been reading for the allotted amount of time. We've been reading from the, A Natural History of Dragons, uh, a memoir by Lady Trent, a book by Marie Brennan. Um, anyways, if you like this content, then make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me anyway, all the information will be in the description below. And as always, um, oh yeah, you can also join the um, Discord server. That should be in the description as well. But anyways, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.